In today's world, satellites guide almost everything we do. They keep planes on course, ships on track, smartphones connected, and even missiles precise. For decades, the United States Global Positioning System, known as GPS, has set the standard. Whether you are ordering an Uber, tracking a package, or using Google Maps to find your way, chances are you are relying on GPS. But what happens if those signals are taken away? That was the reality China faced in the 1990s, and it became the trigger for one of the most ambitious space projects of modern times. The story begins in July 1993 with a Chinese cargo ship called the Yinhe. The ship had sailed from Tianjin, headed toward Kuwait. Then came alarming intelligence from the CIA. According to U.S. sources, the ship was carrying materials that could be used to produce chemical weapons, allegedly destined for Iran. Acting on that information, the U.S. Navy intercepted the vessel in the Indian Ocean and ordered it to turn back to China, unload the suspected cargo, and then continue its journey. Yep, this is the U.S. Navy. Return to China, unload chemical weapons material, then resume your voyage. Over. The crew checked their own ship but found nothing suspicious. Convinced the accusations were false, they decided to keep going. Washington, however, did not back down. Middle Eastern governments were pressed not to allow the Yinhe to dock at any of their ports. What happened next showed just how much control the United States held at sea. Access to GPS was cut. The Yinhe lost its navigation system. It was left adrift in the vast Indian Ocean, unable to move with certainty. For more than three weeks, the vessel drifted while food and fuel supplies ran dangerously low. Only after repeated appeals did the crew receive emergency aid delivered by a small ship from the UAE. By late August, the Yinhe was finally allowed to dock, not in Kuwait as planned, but in Dammam, Saudi Arabia. There, a joint Saudi and American inspection team thoroughly examined the ship. The results surprised many. They found no chemical weapons and no prohibited material on board. China reacted angrily, demanding that the Clinton administration issue a formal apology and compensate the company for its losses. The United States refused. There was no apology and no compensation. For Beijing, this was more than just a diplomatic dispute. It was a moment of realization. GPS, controlled entirely by the U.S. military, was not just a navigation tool. It was also a potential weapon of leverage, and China now understood the risks of depending on it. And this wasn't an isolated incident. Just two years later, in 1995, another crisis shook China-U.S. relations. Washington lifted its ban on visits from top Taiwanese officials, allowing Taiwanese President Li Tenghui to travel to the U.S. for a visit to his alma mater, Cornell University. This move infuriated Beijing. At that time, Taiwan was becoming increasingly vocal about independence. President Li even spoke of dealing with China on a state-to-state -state basis. China, of course, rejected this outright, sticking firmly to its One China policy. In response, Beijing announced military exercises in the Taiwan Strait. The U.S. countered by sending two aircraft carriers near Taiwan's waters. And to put additional pressure on both Washington and Taipei, China test-fired several missiles into waters near Taiwan's coast. Most hit their intended targets, but some mysteriously disappeared mid-flight when their GPS signals suddenly dropped. The Chinese military suspected that the U.S. had jammed them. So, between the Taiwan Strait crisis and the Yinhe GPS incident, Beijing came to a sharp realization. They were too dependent on U.S. navigation systems. In any crisis, that dependency could be disastrous. That's when China began accelerating work on its own satellite navigation system, Beidou. The goal was simple. Never again be vulnerable to U.S.-controlled GPS and eventually present a strong global alternative. By the end of 2000, China launched the first phase of the Beidou Navigation Satellite System, or BDS-1. It relied on just three to four satellites and provided basic navigation services, but only within China. In short, it was more of a national navigation system rather than a global one. After the first phase, China moved quickly into the second. Between 2004 and 2012, it launched about 15 new satellites. By 2012, the BDS-2 system became operational,
providing navigation services across the Asia-Pacific region. In simple terms, China now had a regional navigation system, sending a clear message that it could offer an alternative to GPS, at least in its own backyard. The real milestone came in the third phase. From 2015 to 2020, China launched dozens more satellites at high speed. By 2018, BDS-3 was providing services worldwide. And in June 2020, the final Beidou-3 satellite was placed into orbit, completing the system. That meant global coverage. China had now joined the US, Russia, and Europe as the fourth power with its own global positioning system. Today, Beidou has more than 50 satellites in orbit. This gave Beijing not just greater strategic independence, but also positioned Beidou as a global competitor to America's GPS, Russia's GLONASS, and Europe's Galileo systems. Remember, navigation satellites aren't just about maps. They're critical for aviation, the military, surveillance, transportation, and even disaster management. And here's an important point. Don't confuse navigation satellites with systems like Starlink. Starlink and its rivals, like Telesat in Canada, OneWeb in Europe, or China's Chenfan and Honghu-3, use satellites in low Earth orbit, about 160 to 2,000 kilometers above the Earth. Their job is internet coverage, not navigation. Since they're closer to Earth, they offer fast internet but cover smaller areas, which is why thousands of satellites are needed. Starlink alone already has over 8,000 satellites in orbit. Navigation satellites, on the other hand, typically operate in medium Earth orbit, at altitudes above 2,000 kilometers and below 35,786 kilometers from Earth. Most are placed in the 12,000 to 25,000 kilometer range, high enough to cover large areas, but not too far to cause major delays. Some are even launched into geostationary orbit at 35,786 kilometers, where they appear fixed over one spot on Earth, perfect for broadcasting, communications, and sometimes navigation. China also uses a special type called IGSO satellites, which trace a figure eight pattern over the planet to improve three-dimensional accuracy. When you compare Beidou with GPS, some analysts argue Beidou has certain advantages. Unlike GPS, which is mainly one-way, Beidou also provides short two-way messaging. That means even if a user is cut off from normal communication networks, they can send or receive short emergency messages, something especially valuable in disasters or military scenarios. In terms of accuracy, civilian GPS usually gives a margin of about 3 meters. Beidou, however, is often accurate to less than a meter. Inside China, where ground stations strengthen the signals, accuracy can even reach the centimeter level. Another factor is technology. Most Beidou satellites were launched between 2015 and 2020, making them relatively modern. GPS, meanwhile, has been around since 1978, and some of its satellites date back to the 1990s or early 2000s. That older infrastructure means Beidou satellites carry newer sensors and are generally more resistant to signal jamming. And numbers matter too. Beidou has more than 50 satellites in orbit, while GPS typically maintains about 30. A larger constellation means more coverage and redundancy, giving China stronger positioning capabilities worldwide. Now, let's connect this to recent events. After the Iran-Israel conflict, many Iranians reported serious disruptions in location-based services. Ride-hailing apps, delivery services, and other GPS-dependent systems took a hit. One driver for a popular Iranian app admitted he only picked up passengers who already knew their routes, since navigation apps had become unreliable. Iran's government even confirmed that it had deliberately jammed signals, especially around Tehran and other cities, to protect key sites from precision strikes which rely heavily on satellite guidance. While jamming offers security benefits, it also disrupts daily life for ordinary citizens. Some Iranian officials suggested shifting civilian services from GPS to Beidou. But here's the catch. Switching isn't that simple. Civilian systems depend on smartphone chipsets and app infrastructure, which usually pull signals from multiple systems, GPS, Beidou, Galileo, and GLONASS, all at once. It would take major hardware and software changes for Iran to move fully to Beidou at the civilian level. The military side is different. As far back as 2015, when the U.S. restricted Iran's access to military-grade GPS, 
Tehran began leaning on Beidou. By the time China and Iran signed a 25-year strategic cooperation deal in 2021, Iranian hardware was already being upgraded to integrate Beidou signals. That's why in the recent conflict, Iran's missile systems managed to hit several Israeli targets with surprising accuracy. That's how the Beidou system grew from a regional experiment into a global network, shaping not just China's independence, but also the geopolitics of navigation technology. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, share, and support us so we can keep bringing you more stories like this.